Recording is being recorded. Afternoon. My name is Prabhneet Singh. This talk will focus on scalable locking within OpenJ9. Over a high level concept known as mechanical sympathy, which refers to understanding how the hardware works and taking that into consideration when designing the software. In the beginning, we will see how OpenJ9's current locking strategy becomes a bottleneck under final contention. And then we will learn how the current design goes against the principle of mechanical sympathy. And we will dive into scalable locks and associated features. The goal is not just to resolve the bottleneck scene in OpenJ9 locking, but it is also to make OpenJ9 locking more scalable, competitive, and future ready. But I'm assuming everyone has the basic knowledge of threads, locks, and atomic operations such as compare and swap. For those who are unfamiliar with these concepts, I will try to briefly describe these concepts as they show up in the presentation. is going to focus on scalability of locks. To evaluate a lock's scalability, we need to know what lock contention is. Lock contention is evaluated by the number of threads that are competing to acquire the lock at the same time. The low lock contention would refer to fewer threads wanting to acquire the lock, whereas high lock contention would refer to a substantially larger number of threads that want to acquire the lock. So please refer to the graph on the slide to visualize the lock's performance, which is on the y-axis in terms of time to acquire a lock varies with the lock contention, which is on the x-axis and represented by the number of threads which want to acquire or compete for the lock at the same time. The J9 bottleneck, which will be covered later, arises due, during high lock contention. And the two main symptoms of high lock contention are a drop in throughput and a very high resource utilization, which prevents useful work from being done. Language abstracts locking. So a Java developer doesn't need to worry about locking in the Java code. So the Java language provides a synchronized keyword for abstracting locks. An example use case of the synchronized keyword has been provided. The Java virtual machine is responsible for supporting the synchronized keyword and implementing the locking features. An example of high lock contention in Java would be where 100 threads use the synchronized keyword on a single object on a 24 machine at the same time. Before we dive into OpenJ9 locking's bottleneck, let's see how OpenJ9 implements locking and J9 uses a data structure named system monitors for locking when there is lock contention. This data structure is not only used with Java objects, but it is also used by the VM, JIT, and GC native threads. This data structure is maintained in OMR. It implements a type of lock which performs good at low lock contention, but collapses at high lock contention. Next, we will study the type of lock used in the system monitor and why it collapses at high lock contention. Here we will dive into the concept of mechanical sympathy, where one needs to account for the hardware in order to design good software. The system monitor implements test and test and set lock or TATUS lock, which is a type of lock with a global lock state. The focal keyword here is global. Global lock state is shared among all the threads that want to acquire the lock. We will see how this global lock state becomes the bottleneck. Before diving into TATUS lock, we will study the performance bottleneck in the context of the test and set or TATUS or TAS lock, which is a simpler form of the TATUS lock. The simple implementation of the TAS lock 
the lock stirs the global lock state. And if true is stirred in the global lock state, then it means a thread has ownership of the lock. And if false has been stirred in the global lock state, then it means the lock is free and anyone who wants can go to acquire the lock. The lock has two main key operations. A thread performs the acquire operation, which is shown on the left side of the slide in order to own the lock. And the release operation, which is shown on the right side of the slide, is performed in order to relinquish ownership of the lock. Focusing on the acquire function, threads rely upon a computer and swap operation, CAS operation, in order to update the global lock state. And then they spin indefinitely performing the CAS until they can acquire the lock. In practice, we won't spin indefinitely. We use a technique known as spin and then park, where the threads only spin for a short period of time and then park themselves. The park technique allows threads to perform useful work. Uh, now let's dive into mechanical sympathy and study the impact of the CAS operation on the processor's cache. Cache uses a cache coherency protocol for enforcing data consistency. You guys can see the MIOC protocol, which is used on most modern architectures. In this protocol, a cache line can exist in either of the five listed states, modified, owned, exclusive, and invalid. So how does a CAS operation impact the processor's cache's performance? of an uncontent, uncontented CAS, which would translate to one thread trying to acquire the lock, the global lock state would persist in one cache in an exclusive state, which is going to be very cheap to maintain. As the lock becomes contented, different threads would perform a CAS on the global lock state. This would lead to a lot of cache invalidations and heavy bus traffic, heavily contented Heavily contended CAS operations can saturate the processor's caches and buses. The locking code will prevent other useful work to be performed due to the hardware saturation. It's going to be a scalability killer for an application which wants to scale by increasing the number of threads. So we just covered a CAS operation, but on other architectures such as PPC, there are instructions such as fence and flush, which show similar scalability issues, which we noticed with CAS. Uh, now I would like to show uh, a simulation or on how the task lock and the cache is together. You can see a multi-core processor. Each core has caches. Uh, everyone should know that L1 cache is smaller and faster and closer to the core. L2 cache is bigger than the L1 cache and further away from the core. In this example, threads 1 and 3 are scheduled on core 1, and threads 2 and 4 are scheduled on core 2. Thread 1 wants to acquire the lock. Thread 1 will get the lock, lock's global state from the main memory to the L2 cache and then the L1 cache. And let's assume no one owns the lock at this point. So thread one will successfully acquire the lock. Since only thread one competes for the lock, the lock's global state will persist in one set of caches in an exclusive state, which is going to be inexpensive to maintain. Thread one still owns the lock, but now thread two also wants to acquire the lock will execute the CAS operation in an infinite loop until it acquires the lock. This is going to be the acquire function we saw a few slides ago. Every CAS that thread two performs will cause bus traffic and cache invalidations. This is not useful work. The CPU utilized for the CAS can be used by other threads to do important work. So a low lock contention case, some designers would say that this is bearable we can live with it and may end up neglecting this issue from a scalability perspective. 
let's scale the previous example and consider a multi-core processor with 96 cores. So instead of only thread two and core two competing for the lock, let's assume a thread running on each core wants to acquire the lock. Now the lock's global state would need to be maintained in all the 96 cache sets in the processor. It's going to be very expensive. You're wasting resources on a super expensive processor just for acquiring a lock. Work is being done. The, app the application's performance is going to be drastically impacted. Most likely, it will experience a scalability collapse. So again, I would like to remind everyone about mechanical sympathy at this point. You know, know your hardware when you design your software. Neglecting this basic principle would lead to failure at some point. Here we can see the task logs performance. I think we, I, we saw this graph earlier as well. Performance is reflected by the time to acquire the lock on the y-axis and lock contention is shown by the number of threads competing for the lock on the x-axis. The main point to take away here is that the performance of task locks collapses in high lock contention scenarios, which may arise just from an application scaling. Achieve the ideal case where the time to acquire a lock remains constant as the lock contention increases. Although it is going to be impossible to achieve the ideal case in practice, we can still try to get closer to the ideal scenario with better locks. And earlier, OpenJ9 system monitors use test and test and set or TATUS locks. The difference between TAS and TATUS locks is reflected in the acquire function, which is shown on the left side of this slide. In the acquire operation for the TATUS lock, there's an additional while loop which did not exist in the TAS. This while loop acts as a, as a buffer for the CAS operation. It's supposed to reduce the frequency of CAS operations. In return, it's supposed to improve the lock's performance. How this minor tweak in the locks implementation impacts the locks performance. See the performance of a TAS, TARTUS, and an ideal lock. TAS and TARTUS behave similarly. The difference is in the point of collapse. The TARTUS lock scales a little better than the TAS lock before reaching its inevitable collapse. The slight improvement in the TARTUS performance is due to the reduction in the CAS operation, CAS operations which resulted from the additional while loop we saw in the previous slide. Point, you know, I would like you to again remind about mechanical sympathy and how everything is linked together, software and hardware. And we have looked at the bottleneck that OpenJ 9s current locking strategy has, and we want to fix the bottleneck seen with the TARDIS lock. We did a literature survey. We looked into the locking literature and across Q-based locks. Variants of Q-based locks. Here, I have listed seven variants of Q-based locks. Q-based locks are ha highly valued for their performance benefits on modern processor architectures. It has, it has been adopted by IBM in some of its products. Even the Linux kernel has started using Q-based locks since the past five years. Going as far as to patent K42 locks. The amazing value Q-based locks provide. Now we we had a we had to decide which Q-based locks to use in OpenJ9 with key community members. McKinney, who is a distinguished engineer and CTO of Linux at IBM, was consulted because the Linux kernel recently adopted Q-based locks. Doug Lee, who is the owner of the Java util concurrent library, was consulted because of his 
contributions to the Java concurrency and synchronization library. The purpose of consultation was to make sure that we are going in the right direction and we don't end up wasting our time. So after consulting and studying the log performance of Qubit logs in the recent academic papers, we decided to try the MCS log in the OMR system monitor. Let's see how the MCS lock works. It's used. The lock contains the tail of the queue, a pointer to the tail of the queue. Since our thread specific nodes, they contain the thread specific lock state, whether a thread can acquire the lock or if it has to wait for the lock to become available. It also contains a pointer to the next element in the queue to the next threads node that will acquire the lock. To add elements to the queue, the atomic exchange operation is used. Generally asked at this point is what's the difference between an atomic exchange and a compare and swap operation? Write to a memory address atomically. Task can fail if the compare doesn't succeed. So it has to be repeated until it is successful whereas an atomic exchange operation always succeeds. So this should summarize the main difference between an atomic exchange and a compare and swap operation. So let's go through a simulation which shows the work of the MCS lock. The lock is free, the queue is empty, so the lock stores null, in, null for the queue's point, null, sorry, null for the queue's tail which means there are no elements in the queue. One wants to acquire the lock. The thread one appends its thread specific node to the queue's tail, which is shown as thread one or T1 on the slide. And the lock now points to the thread one's queue node, T1. Thread one notices that there is no one in the queue other than itself, hence, it ends up acquiring the lock. Thread two also wants to acquire the lock now, but thread one still owns the lock. Thread two will append an element to the queue's tail, which is going to be similar to what thread one did. Lock will point to thread two's queue node because in a queue elements are generally appended to the tail of the queue. The lock will point to T2. Thread 2 will notice that there is another threads node in the queue, so it will update T1's next field to point to its queue node. Then it is going to busy wait or spin until its local state is updated to true by the current owner, current lock owner when it releases the lock. Step forward, let's say thread 3 also wants to acquire the lock. It will perform the same steps as thread two, append its node to the tail of the queue, then lock will point to the thread to thread three's node. Thread three will notice thread two is already in the queue waiting for the lock. It will update the next element in thread two's node to point to T3, which is itself. Then it is going to busy wait or spin. The queue will grow as more and more threads want to acquire the lock. For a case where a thread wants to release the lock, in this case, thread one releases the lock. While releasing the lock, thread one will update the local state in thread two's node to true. Thread two, which is waiting to acquire the lock, will note the change in the local state from false to true and then acquire the lock. Similarly, thread three will lock once thread two releases the lock, and at the end, the queue will again be empty until other threads want to acquire the lock. This summarizes the basic working of the MCS lock. Makes the MCS lock better than the TARDIS lock. The difference is in how the lock state is maintained. In the TARDIS lock, there is 
a global lock state which is shared among all the threads. But in the MCS lock, each thread has its own thread specific lock state, which only gets updated by one thread, which is going to be the next element in the queue. Each thread has its own lock state, and only one thread is ever going to update that local lock state. This eliminates the need of a CAS to maintain the lock state. The CAS in the MCS lock gets rid of the cache and bus saturation, which was seen with the TARTUS lock. Look at the of TARTUS and MCS locks. This slide has the acquire functions for both TARTUS lock and the MCS lock. TARTUS acquire is on the left side of the slide and the MCS acquire is on the right side of the slide. In the TARTUS lock, there can be unbounded CAS operations while a thread spins to acquire the lock by updating the lock's global state. But in the MCS lock, there is no CAS needed while spinning because only one thread will update a thread's local state. So you don't need atomicity to update the thread specific local lock state in the MCS lock. Let's see how the absence of the CAS operation in the MCS lock improves the lock's performance. The performance data is taken from a locking paper, which is shown at the bottom of the slide. The data was collected using a micro benchmark where threads compete for a critical section via a lock. It is written in C and it doesn't reflect performance of a Java application. The benchmark measures the lock performance while increasing the lock contention. The lock performance is shown on the y-axis in terms of throughput of lock acquires per second. And the lock contention is shown on the x-axis in terms of the number of threads that want to simultaneously compete for the lock. The blue line in the graph shows the performance of the TARDIS lock and the orange line shows the performance of the MCS lock throughput corresponds to better performance. If you look closer in the graph, TARTUS lock is doing nothing at high lock contention. It is just wasting resources. On the other hand, the MCS lock performs better than the TARTUS lock overall. It also shows, but it also shows symptoms of scalability collapse. The only difference being that the throughput at the point of collapse is higher than that of the TARDIS lock. In the presentation, we will see, or we will cover a feature which will help us avoid the scalability collapse in lock. But being, uh, just to summarize, the MCS lock performs and scales better than TARDIS lock in terms of scalability and throughput. Just looking at throughput won't be a complete evaluation of the MCS lock. We also need to compare the worst case space complexity or the memory requirements between the MCS and TARDIS locks. This is a global lock state. So the space complexity is proportional to the number of locks. In the MCS lock, a queue is used each thread competing for the lock appends its own node into the queue. So the space complexity is going, to, is going to be proportional to the number of locks multiplied by the number of competing threads. Uh, this space complexity is evaluated in the scope of the entire JVM. Of the MCS lock, the space complexity depends on the lock contention. And in most Java applications, only three to four percent are highly contended. So we won't hit the worst case space complexity for every MCS lock in the JVM. But there's definitely going to be an increase in the memory requirement when transitioning from the TARTUS to MCS lock. But for the performance improvement from the MCS lock, we will have to sacrifice on memory, but we can the memory cost arising from the MCS lock by managing and reusing the queue nodes per thread 
using a data structure in OMR named J9 pool. What is the current state of the MCS lock implementation in OpenJ9? We have implemented a basic MCS lock and incorporated it with the system monitor within OMR. Our implementation addresses the special cases such as out of order lock acquires and releases. The support for arc wait and notify features, which to be implemented in the context of the MCS lock. Studies do not cover these special cases. So we may not see performance improvements similar to the academic graphs or performance numbers that we recently saw. Current implementation is complete. There is an OMR pull request open for the MCS implementation. It passes all the OMR and OpenJ9 testing. The only pending task is performance benchmarking. After benchmarking, we can most likely merge this pull request after a code review. We plan to further optimize and improve the performance of the basic MCS lock. We're going to dive into future work, other ways through which we can improve the basic MCS lock implementation, or you know, in case MCS locks do not as well as TARDIS locks in all workloads. We just saw that MCS lock doesn't have the same bottleneck as seen in the TARDIS lock, which helps the MCS lock to scale better in high lock contention. But we did not cover about, or we did not account for low lock contention. MCS lock have similar performance to the TARDIS lock for low lock contention. In the current OpenJ9 implementation, the, the TARDIS lock takes two atomic operations, one in the acquire function and the other in the release function. This is in the best case scenario for the TARDIS lock. MCS locks in the worst case scenario will only perform two atomic operations, one in the acquire function and the other in the release function. So I speculate that the MCS and TARDIS locks should have the same performance in low lock contention. I saw this graph a few slides ago. I brought it back to compare the performance of MCS and TARTUS locks under low lock contention. The new addition here is the green circle and the green arrow which points to the low lock contention area. This graph reiterates that the MCS lock has similar performance to TARTUS lock under low lock contention. After benchmarking, let's say we find that the MCS lock is slower than the TARDIS lock for low lock contention. So what to do now? Here, reactive locking algorithms come to play. These algorithms were introduced in an academic paper, which is shown at the bottom of the slide. We will use a uh, reactive algorithms to address the poor performance of the MCS lock in low lock contention workloads reactive algorithms do. Reactive algorithms will split the system monitor code path into two. The simple or default code path would be to use the TARTIS lock for handling low lock contention workloads. We will need instrumentation to measure the lock contention. So as the lock contention becomes high enough for the MCS lock to perform better than the TARTIS lock, transform the TARDIS lock to an MCS lock in the system monitor. The active approach is going to be the fallback solution in case my assumption of MCS locks performance in low lock contention workloads ends up being false. Clock issues do not end here. The MCS lock suffer from suffers from another issue known as the lock rater preemption issue. To understand this issue, we need to look at the working of the MCS lock. In the MCS lock, only one thread, only the next thread in the queue is able to acquire the lock, which is in contrast to the TARDIS lock where 
where all the threads can simultaneously compete for the lock. The one thread which is able to acquire the lock may be preempted. Resuming such, a pre such preempted threads can result into an expensive contact switch, which can negatively impact the lock's performance. So this is a simple description for the lock waiter preemption issue. Again, to summarize, scheduling the ne next thread in the MCS lock queue will be expensive. Will be expensive. This will adversely impact the lock's performance. The lock waiter preemption issue. Before we dive into fixing the lock waiter preemption issue, we will discuss a feature known as concurrency restri concurrency restriction. And then we will later dive into how this feature solves the lock waiter preemption problem. Concurrency restriction. You guys would need to know about two terms before understanding what concurrency restriction is. The first term is active thread set, which means a set of threads which are allowed to compete for the lock. And then the second term is passive thread set, which means, or which comprises of a set of threads that are not allowed to acquire the lock. Dive into what is the objective of concurrency restriction. The objective is stated on this slide. It is, it is to minimize the, min, minimize the size of the active threads set while still remaining preserving, ensuring there are sufficient threads in the active thread set to saturate the lock. For saturating the lock, we aim to maximize occupancy in the critical section. The goal of concurrency restriction is to introduce unfairness in the MCS locks admission policy. The implementation is very fair, so there's no unfairness. See, concurrency restriction can be implemented with the MCS locks. Implementing concurrency restri restriction, the main queue of the MCS lock is into two smaller queues. One for the active threads and the other is used for the passive threads. The logic for concurrency restriction goes in the release operation of the MCS lock. The elements are moved from the active to passive queues, vice versa, in order to achieve the objective of the concurrency restriction feature, which we saw in the previous slide. Unfairness achieved. It is achieved by occasionally scheduling the latest thread which wants to acquire the lock. The latest or the newest thread will incur the least cost from a scheduling perspective. Since it's already running on the processor, it won't have to go through an expensive context switch. How do we disrupt order in the MCS lock? This is accomplished by moving an element from the tail of the passive queue, which is going to represent a newer or latest thread. And then we're going to move this element to the head of the active queue. When we do this move, the element or the thread which is going to be moved will end up owning the lock. The way we make this decision is going to be random. So we rely upon randomness to inject unfairness in the MCS lock. Price. Concurrency restriction aims to reduce the involuntary preemption rates by inducing unfairness to the MCS lock's admission policy. In future, the basic MCS lock implementation will incorporate concurrency restriction in some form. This will allow us to handle the lock waiter preemption issue by inducing unfairness. Here we can see the performance of the MCS lock with 
and without concurrency restriction. Concurrency restriction and the performance data are both taken from an academic paper, which is included at the bottom of the slide. The benchmark used is a stress latency benchmark that measures lock performance while varying the lock contention. Similar to the previous graphs, lock performance is on the y-axis and the lock contention is on the x-axis. With concurrency restriction is shown on the graph and its counterpart without concurrency restriction is shown in red. It is very clear that the MCS lock with concurrency restriction achieves and maintains a steady state throughput at high lock, lock intention. In one of the previous graphs, we saw the same scalability collapse that we noticed with the TARDIS lock, but with concurrency restriction, the scalability collapse no longer exists. Again, I would like to bring back the concept of mechanical sympathy. If you understand how your software is going to work on the hardware, you will be able to design better software. And this feature concurrency restriction is a good example of the application of mechanical sympathy. Concurrency restric uh, restriction lead to better utilization of the hardware, putting it into you know, the context of me mechanical sympathy. How, you know, how did we study the behavior of hardware? The data on the slide is taken from the same paper from where the previous graph is taken. Here, the impact of concurrency restriction is that the number of active threads reduces from 30 to, to five, which means only five threads are needed to maintain maximal occupancy of the critical section. And the impact on the hardware is that CPU utilization reduces by a factor of three. Cache usage drops by 98%, which is reflected by the fewer L3 misses. Overall, the lock performance with concurrency restriction increases by a factor of 16. Impressed by these numbers and, you know, Will be amazing to have such a feature in OpenGL9. Locks will always have a saturation point. By moving from TARTUS to MCS lock, we are just delaying the in inevitable scalability collapse. We need to ask ourselves can we do better than software locks? And the answer is yes, we can do better. Hardware performs faster than software. This is common knowledge. So here I would like to introduce the topic of transactional lock elision. TLE comprises of, or TLE in short, comprises of hardware transactional memory and a software lock. Transactional memory provides hardware instructions for synchronization. Hardware instructions only take a few cycles, whereas using a software cycle, whereas using a software lock may take hundreds of cycles on a CPU. The transactions can yield better performance than a software lock. TLE aims to maximize usage of hardware transactional memory, leads to omission of the software lock. If you rely upon the hardware more and more and not use the software lock as much as possible. Transactional memory will not perform as well as a software lock in all scenarios. So TLE has to decide when to use hardware transactional memory and when to use a software lock. Is the instruction set for hardware transactional memory. X begin, begins a hardware transaction, X end ends a hardware transaction. X abort, X abort allows a transaction to be aborted. X test checks if a transaction is happening. So it's pretty straightforward. And it's a very simple instruction set. 
to know that hardware transactions won't always succeed. In the presence of memory conflicts, transactions will fail. And in case of a failure, a hardware transaction would need to be repeated. Hardware transaction memory instructions are cheap, so we can run them multiple times to evaluate the affinity of a critical section with hardware transactions. So if good performance cannot be achieved with hardware transactions, then we can fall back to using the software lock. This is the simple prem premise behind PLE. I would like to show you guys uh, an abstract TLE design. It is taken from an academic paper, which is referred at the bottom of the slide. There are two primary code paths. Pink code path represents the software lock, and the red code path represents the hardware transaction. The path has provisions for instrumentation. Their statistics are collected for evaluating effectiveness of each approach. For example, effectiveness of hardware transactions can be measured by the number of times the hardware transaction fails before the critical section is successfully executed. So there will be cases where hardware transactions may not perform better than a software, software lock. Turquoise code path represents the decision-making component which decides whether to use the hardware transactions or a software lock before executing the critical section. This summarizes the TLE design. Here we can see a specific use case where transactional lock elision yields better performance. The performance data taken from the same academic paper the abstract TLE design is taken. The microbenchmark uses a skip list based set, which is a data structure implemented using linked lists. It is designed for fast searches. It mostly performs insert and remove operations on this data structure. The performance graph shows the locks performance on the y axis and the contention on the x axis. This specific case performance is shown in the form of speed up, how much improvement you're getting. Proportion represents the performance of a software lock. All other lines represent the performance of different TLE imp imp implementations. What do we deduce from what can we deduce from this graph? The graph shows that TLE performs two to four times faster than just using a software lock. The TLE, improvement, TLE improvements are coming from the hardware transactions. So TLE has the potential to further improve OpenJ9 locking if it is implemented effectively within OpenJ9. Here we began the work on incorporating hardware transactional memory into OpenJ9's locking strategy. We did not meet the minimum compiler requirements to support hardware transactional memory. We use GCC 7 for compiling OpenJ9, or we use newer compilers, which has hardware transactional memory support. So this is going to allow us to easily pursue the work on implementing TLE into OpenJ9. At this point, we are very close to the end of the presentation. We covered a lot of topics today. We saw a bottleneck in OpenJ9 locking related to the system monitor. Our usage of TARTUS, which utilizes a global lock state, leads to a collapse. Then we covered MCS, a qubit, and how it can help with the throughput collapse, which is seen with the TARTUS lock. Work, we covered a backup plan in case MCS lock doesn't perform similar to the TARTUS lock under low lock contention, then we will rely upon reactive algorithms. Then we covered concurrency restriction and how it solves the lock waiter preemption issue by inducing unfairness in the admission policy. At the end, we talked about transactional lock elision, which combines hardware transactional memory and software lock 
achieving better lockup performance. So this talk heavily focused on the basic principle of mechanical sympathy. You can design better software if you are aware how the underlying hardware behaves. So before concluding, I would like to encourage everyone to employ the concept of mechanical sympathy whenever you write code or design. I am at the end of my presentation. But before I would like the help that I received from Dan, Vijay, and Shelly in preparing for this presentation. They put a sincere effort in improving the flow and organization of this presentation. They also provided a lot of constructive feedback to the right dry runs. So I'm sincerely grateful for their help. Now I would gladly address any questions if people have any. Great. Thanks, thanks, Stephanie. Um, yeah, before we go to questions, I guess, um, I just want to say, I guess you will be very busy for the next five years with all these this future work. Um, but anyway, so let's go to uh, questions. Anyone has questions? It was very clear. Um, any questions in Ottawa? We don't have any questions right now in Toronto. I have questions in Toronto. <laughs> okay. Okay. So probably go back from backward. You have many slides. Uh, going to slide number 48, I would say um, we have seen uh, uh, hardware transaction memory uh, for micro benchmark. We can uh, we can get up to uh, 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 a thousand times of speed up. Better, better than software lock. Yeah, but the uh, for example for for the Java um, uh, um, hash table kind of thing because the the scalability of uh, tr transaction lock elision essentially is a diff at the rim of the uh, behavior of the critical section itself. So for 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 the uh, hash table kind of code because it is the 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 critical section actually is disseminating naturally to the different bucket, so you you have little contention itself, and uh, that's why you so basically if you want to use the TLE, then you need you need to uh, can understand that the compiler or whatever can understand the the behavior of the critical section then you can decide whether you are going to use the TLE on I think you're correct and I think this is where instrumentation comes into play you would need to collect statistics to study the critical section and then using the statistics you should be able to decide whether to use TLE or hardware transactions that you fall back to a software lock. So I completely agree with you. Uh, going back to slide 31. Oh, um, is 31. Oh, yeah. I have a suggestion here actually. You, uh, instead of you need to manage uh, J9 pool in a certain way. If, uh, for Java, especially because unless your bytecode is is kind of is it, it, um, is uh, some, somehow modified, uh, unless otherwise the uh, monitor enter and the monitor exit is always in the same method. Um, so. Instead of using J9 pool, probably we can use uh, a uh, stack stack memory allocation. You allocate on a stack in that memory frame as the node. Then uh, you can avoid managing J9 pool. Uh, on the stack, right? You 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 are you need a, a node. You need a node. Instead of putting out the node from a J9 pool, you can use a stack. Um, then that, uh, 
So then uh, that works for cases where there is only one critical section or if a thread only acquires one lock, but what if a thread- No, no, no. why? You, you, certainly you can have multiple nodes on a, on a, in the same stack frame, right? Then how do you get infinite nodes if because you don't you do not know how many nodes you would need or how many locks a thread is going to acquire. So how do you you know while you compile or you you as you interpret it going on or or you, you we are compiling you each each pair of the uh, mon enter mon mon exit you have one node. Node, but then one node per thread. Mm. Yeah, one node. You you have a you have the thread, and you have the thread stack. That is per thread, right? Naturally, so I I believe this is going to be easier and cheaper instead of you have multiple thread containing on the on the gen, on a single J9 pool or something. Each each thread has its own J9 pool, so you you won't see contention. You still need to manage. It. You need to allocate or something. How? Uh... So the way we initialize the NN pool is uh, we pre we tell it to pool which already has ten elements. So each thread has pre-allocated ten elements. Initializes its J9 pool for the lock. Yeah. In my point, basically, you eventually you can run out of a tank or something. You need to, you need to do the management, but use the on stack is easier. Okay, I think that this is just the stump suggestion, and I have a a couple uh, actually technical questions. Yep. Um, going to uh, slide twenty eight. Uh, yep. Um, in terms of in terms of hardware cost, you, a cast versus an exchange is pretty much no difference. It's actually uh, in uh, on power, for example, the, the cast for lock. You have a hint to it saying this is for lock, and. Uh, for exchange, you're saying this cast is is a hint, is an atomic operation. So, so it's not going, as you mentioned, this is going to cast to be eliminated. You just avoid the cast storm. Um, the the other thing is the you you uh, probably going back to uh, slide 27 probably is clearer. Uh, oh, uh, the, the the meeting is gone. <laughs> the meeting is done. Is yeah, the, online? the the WebEx is is died. <laughs> uh, it's still it's still going on. The meeting is going on. It's still being recorded. Uh, you okay. can continue. We can hear you. Oh, okay. You can hear me. So going to tw uh, slide twenty seven, I think. Oh, can you see the slide? Uh, I cannot see the slide anymore. So, I'm 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 looking at the, his his uh, PowerPoint. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's a uh, it's a slide that says uh, what's different about MCS law, uh, law. Yeah, I think it's twenty, at least twenty seven or twenty something. Uh, twenty seven, yes. Uh, twenty seven, twenty six. 26 the release. Okay. You you have a can you have a contention of uh, while um, while you have a new lock enter and the 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 thread is going to release. So you have a contention of you. Uh, the, the 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 thread to release the lock is going to check on itself node while the conflicting thread going to modify that node right 
if there's going to be some. There, there is a contention. How are you going to avoid the out of order thing? You basically the 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 risk. The guy going to release it is checking it is node whether the the uh, the thing is now the node is containing now versus the thread going to enter is going to write to that thing as a thread three or thread two um, the the store versus the read to check you have a order there you have a how to synchronize it, you, you have a problem there, right? No, there are going to be multiple nodes per thread. So if a thread ends up acquiring... No, no, no. I, I'm, I'm not talking about multi-node, multiple nodes. Okay. I'm talking about there are only two threads, for example. Yep. At only one node, right? Yep. The, the, node, the node is the, uh, owned by the holder right now, and then there's a conflict uh, coming from the threat number two, the threat number two doing the compareness swap found that the lock is busy. Now I need to store my thread into the the holder's node. Uh, previously is now, right? I need to tell it, oh, I'm waiting on you, right? So I need to write T2 or T3 or T T1 there. And at the same time, the holder maybe is checking, is going to release. So I need to check whether I have a, I have a waiter or not, right? No, I think uh, how it works is uh, thread one T one is going to release the lock, and the node related to the T one is going to be cleaned, and T one is going to update T two's local state. So yeah. T2 is, so when T2 is going to be notified, it's going to acquire the lock, so. that exactly the point I tried to raise. You have a single memory location. You have multiple threads going to either modify or check. You are, you are going to check yourself, or there are other, other threads that may store into it. Now you have an order there. Whether, when you are going to see my store versus how I'm going to wait. You have, you have a problem to be solved there. For instance, thread T1 updates the local state of T2. Then... So I'm store, right? I'm store saying T2 is waiting on T1. T1 own the lock. Yep. And at the same time, T1 is checking Oh, I'm about to re release the lock. Okay. I'm going to free. Yep. So I'm going to check whether I have a waiter or not, right? I have a vendor. So how do you know I have a waiter? If I, I'm read back, it is now. So the, I'm no, going the, to... The null, oh, sorry, uh, this is the state. It has T2 in it. And no, you cannot assume T2 in it. T2 is stored, is not, the, the store is not visible yet, right? You have, a, you have a latency, for example, you have a whole machine uh, fabric, you, fabric you, need, you need to travel. It takes many, many nanoseconds. So I think we use a write barrier. So whenever the next is- up, Right, we... now you have, a, you have a barrier there and you have a cost there. Yep. Uh, uh, that it, it seems to be not not described here. How you, I, I think you have you have a barrier. You have a consistency uh, to be solved here. I think the right barrier should fix the consistency, right? Uh, you should be able to see. Everyone should be able to see the update. Not not that simple. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I I think it will, I need to think about it. How how you 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 are going to? This is one scenario of the the, the enter and the release. You have a conflict there. You have a consistency there, order in there. Plus you have one when you have multiple um, 
multiple thread going, trying to enter um, only one component so what succeeded that one probably is easier to solve yeah okay I think I'm going to show you my implementation. So I think those, like we can talk later and then, you know, I can give you a better explanation by referring to my implementation. Yeah. Okay. I actually didn't get your name. I... At least it's Julian. Julian? Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Julian. Any other questions? Any questions in uh, Ottawa? No questions in Ottawa. No questions? Okay. Um, so that concludes the uh, Vitali talk today. Um, I wanted to thank Shelley Lambert for organizing the event in Ottawa um, concurrently um, as the Toronto event. In the future, I look forward to working with uh, the Ottawa team more uh, in terms of bringing some of the technologies in the J9VM and GC teams um, to, to the talk series so that the, the JIT team can also benefit from the, from the knowledge over there. Okay, so um, thank you. Oh. Uh, we have uh, new hires, so I'll just introduce them. Okay. Let me just... okay, thank you. I'm going to stop the recording now. Oh.